So I'm, I'm Brandon Cook. I'm an application performance specialist at NERSC. And this talk is going to be about the different GPU programming model options that are available at NERSC. Uh, before I get started, I want to reiterate or, or touch again on some of the points that, that Jack made um, in his presentation. So starting, starting out, just a few comments on the difference between CPUs and GPUs. So a CPU is, um, is really a, a, a architecture designed to reduce latency. So you have a few number of very fast threads that can run at high frequency. You have large caches and um, a lot of silicon dedicated to supporting things like branching and, and switching back and forth between different types of code. Um, you also have very large amounts of, of memory, but it's relatively slow. On the other hand, a GPU is a throughput oriented device. So it's really suited for parallel work, particularly when you're doing the same operation on many elements. So grid points, particles, um, anything where you're applying the same thing to, to many, many different elements of data, it's usually a good fit. It has many, many more threads, um, but individually each of those threads is, is less powerful than a CPU thread. Um, the memory capacity is, is smaller, um, but much, much faster, as Jack pointed out. So these are just some things to keep in mind. And to start from the very beginning, there's, I want to talk a little bit about the, this, just in general, the style of programming. So in header, this is a heterogeneous model, right? So you, you're still executing serial CPU code, but interspersed with that, you're, you're launching or offloading work to, to a device. And so what this kind of means is in general, you should keep latency sensitive and serial work on the, the CPU. And as Jack mentioned, the, the cost for moving data between the device and the host can be quite high. So it's always best to keep the data wherever it's used. Um, so either device or host. As for what's in this talk today, there are many options for compiled languages, so C, C++, and Fortran that we're going to cover. Um, later today, we'll be hearing about things like Python and machine learning and AI frameworks. So what, what does the landscape of, of these different models look like? Um, I sort of arbitrarily chose two axes to, to slice this across. Um, so on the, on the horizontal axis, we have ease of use or, or level of control, which is also a bit of a proxy for kind of number of features um, or what your possibilities are. Um, and so all the way on the very right, we have CUDA, which is the native programming model for NVIDIA GPUs. But it's also the lowest on the portability axis because um, that's there's really one, one main compiler, um, LLVM can do it. So one or two compilers that, that can support CUDA and it really only runs on NVIDIA hardware. And then still offering quite a lot of control and, um, and features, but and a, and a little bit less, I would say verbose than writing kind of raw CUDA are your C++ frameworks. So these are things like Cocos or Sickle, um, and we'll touch on those as well. Then the next, um, a bit easier in my opinion to use than those in, in several situations are directive-based models. So these are, you know, something if you've been writing OpenMP code on CPUs, it's it's similar. You, you have a set of directives um, that allow you to offload work as well. And OpenACC is, is a, kind of a similar, similar story to OpenMP. It's a directive-based model. And then finally, um, I put the 
some Fortran and C++ logos up here because there's increasing support for um, offload and parallelism directly in those standards. So in C++, there's the, the uh, parallel standard template library um, that's many features really showed up in C++ 17. Um, and this can be a really powerful approach. Um, and that will allow you to express some parallelism that can run on, on many different platforms. I think even Microsoft compilers support that. Um, and then same thing for Fortran, there's, there's do concurrent and offload support for intr array intrinsics like matrix multiplications um, and transposes. So let, let's start with the, the native model or, or, or CUDA. Um, and I think this is a good place to start because it really serves as a reference point for, for all the other models. Um, and knowing, knowing what's going on, at least at a, at a high level in CUDA, um, can help you understand what's happening behind the scenes for the higher level models. So in terms of benefits and pros and cons, um, you know, the, the obvious pro is that it, CUDA is co-designed with NVIDIA's hardware. Um, so you get full control and direct access to essentially every feature of, of an NVIDIA GPU by using CUDA. Um, typically by being as, that close to the hardware, it also means that you can have the maximum possible performance and I say possible because there might be um, a large amount of tuning that you need to do uh, of things like launch parameters, et cetera, that I can get into um, in order to actually achieve that maximum performance. The, the downsides are it's obviously not portable and the code itself can be a bit more verbose than some of the other options. So I think the starting with CUDA from the very basics, CUDA is an extension of C++. So CUDA C or C++ is an extension of the base language. And the, the real key thing that it provides is this extension um, called a kernel. And what a kernel does is it's, a, it's like a regular function, except it's executed some number of times in parallel by different CUDA threads. Um, and you indicate that you have a kernel with this, with these special markers like underscore underscore global. Um, and then you invoke these kernels with this special triple um, Chevron syntax. So let, let's keep going and, and dive a little bit into what, what does this syntax mean and what does it mean to launch a kernel? So one kernel consists of a grid of blocks. And this, this grid of blocks can be one, two, or three dimensional. And then within each block, you have um, a set of threads that can also be indexed in one, two, or three dimensions. And so when you launch, when you launch a kernel, you say how many blocks you want and how many threads per block. And those parameters can either be integers or these um, dimension three types for, for the higher dimensions. And that lets you really map um, the, that indexing comes in here and lets you, lets you kind of easily map this sort of parallel work specification to um, you know, multi-dimensional multi problems. So the, those threads in, in um, so that thread hierarchy comes with a, a, mem a corresponding memory hierarchy that Jack touched upon. So the, the global memory, or you might hear HBM, um, this is the memory on the GPU. So that's accessible to, to different kernels. So multiple kernels or different grids can, can each access that global memory. Then if you zoom in the shared memory that Jack mentioned, that's Low, that's private to a particular thread block within a grid. And then even finer, each, each thread itself has 
a very small amount of per thread local memory available. So this, this talk isn't a, a deep dive into the, the details of, of CUDA programming. Um, there's a huge amount of content available online about this. Um, I do recommend that anybody who's going to do NVIDIA GPU programming should read um, at least the first few sections of the, the CUDA programming guide. And that will really help baseline your, your knowledge of um, what, what's going on with the device. And I can definitely recommend it. It's, it's, uh, it's possibly more, more accessible than you think. Um, and then there's also the NVIDIA blog and um, GTC talk and slides series that I definitely recommend. And then I'll, I'll kind of end with a, a tip or, or maybe a warning. Um, so there's a huge amount of, of content available if you go online and look for CUDA. Um, I'll just caution you to, to definitely check the dates of, of whatever content you're looking at because CUDA has definitely changed um, in, in some cases significantly over the years um, with new features and you know, restrictions relaxed, et cetera. Um, so definitely check the date and make sure you're you're reading um, kind of a modern source that um, that doesn't you know give you information that's out of date. So kind of moving moving along to my, on my uh, my through the landscape here onto C plus plus um, frameworks. So these are typically these are usually built as as cross platform abstraction layers. And they, they give you a set of um, modern C++ um, abstractions and primitives that you can compose to, to express your application. And they, they tend to target accelerators and CPUs um, from, from multiple vendors. So as a pro, these tend to come with very powerful uh, high-level abstractions. Uh, they usually have integrated tools and libraries and I guess I, I didn't write it here, but you can also get very high performance. Um, the, the downside of these are um, you have to write C++ if that's, that's not really a downside, but that, that could be if your application's in Fortran, say. Um, they require some amount of buy-in. So typically, you'd have to convert significant elements of your, your application to one of these frameworks or spend a lot of time getting the the glue code for, for a good interface setup, which can be tricky. Um, they can often come with a learning curve. And in some cases, these are, these are really new or up and coming kind of projects that may or may not have uh, direct vendor support. Um, and so, you know, if, if ecosystem maturity and the ability to, to pay somebody to work on it for you, contractually is, uh, is important, then that could also be a con. The, the two main C++ frameworks that uh, are available at NERSC are, are Cocos and Sickle. Um, Cocos is a, is a project, it's largely run out of Sandia, but has broad support within the Department of Energy and uh, is, is built as an ecosystem that includes a programming model and abstractions and then uh, a number of libraries and tools support that come with it. And Sickle is a, is a cross-platform cross abstraction layer that is um, largely at, at this point in time being, a lot, a lot of support is coming from uh, Intel um, because this is the native programming model for the upcoming Aurora system, um, but it's it's not proprietary. Sickle is a standard owned by is a standard run by Kronos Group, which is not Intel. Um, so it's an independent, open standard. Uh, it'll be familiar to uh, anyone who's done work with OpenCL. It's it's kind of like the C plus plus version of that. Okay, so start starting with Cocos. Um, 
as I mentioned, it's uh, multiple DOE labs are contributing. NERSC has something like two staff members who are who are directly part of the project and, and contributing in various ways. Um, it's funded by the ECP. Um, the NNSA labs have, in particular, really embraced this. Um, and this is, it's all open and available. You can go to github.com slash cocos. Uh, and they have a really great set of tutorials and examples uh, available and an extremely helpful Slack channel, by the way. Um, and then I've also included here the reference to their, their most recent paper, which, which really uh, outlines all of the different capabilities that, um, that are available. Um, and then I can also recommend if you, if you Google for this GTC talk, um, this is a great talk, which uh, I think the lead developer of, of this or the person leading the project kind of talks through all the, the available options. So just to, to kind of dive in and give a, a little bit of a flavor of, of what, what Cocos is about, it, some of the main abstractions are, are views, memory spaces, and execution spaces. So view is like a shared pointer to multi-dimensional multi data um, that is in a particular memory space, and then it comes with the layout. And so what, what a layout means is basically which, which index is the fast one. And this abstraction is important for, for getting good performance on CPUs and GPUs with the same code, um, because you can swap the layout without changing anything else. And then the other abstractions are, are yeah, memory spaces and execution spaces, which are where data is stored and then where operations are executed. So here's a, a vector addition example that you'll see everywhere um, implemented in Cocos. One thing I want to point out is that this entire code is, is uh, you know, Cocosified, if you will. Uh, in my experience, I find the least resistance when I minimize mixing of, of Cocos and, and other code. Um, you really just hand, hand control over all the data management to Cocos and let it figure it out. So in this case, I'm allowing this Cocos view object to manage the data. Um, I use a parallel for pattern to express how I want operations defined in this Lambda function to, to be applied to that data. And finally, I even use the, the Cocos reduction pattern to compute a final sum. And so at, at this point, I want to mention that you know, in this Toy 1D example, I don't really take advantage of the, the layout abstraction, but with, with more dimensions, um, that hiding of the organization of, of data and memory uh, allows for cache utilization, good cache utilization on CPUs, and allows for coalesced memory trap, um, memory transactions on GPUs. So this is a really powerful abstraction if you if you're targeting high performance CPU and GPU code. Okay, I've, having given a, a small taste of what uh, Cocos looks like, let's talk a little bit about Sickle. Um, so Sickle, the, the support for A100 and NVIDIA GPUs is, is under active development. Uh, this, is, this is actually joint work between um, NERSC, uh, ALCF, and uh, a company called Codeplay, um, where we're, we're actively targeting support for A100. Um, and that, that project is, is really progressing, is underway now, and it's progressing really nicely, but it's still, um, it means that the support is is brand new, but it's it's the feature set is is uh, is really good. So again, DPC plus plus, which is an implementation of of Sickle, um, is the native model for for Aurora, and so that that particular compiler, which is based on LVM, is is directly supported by Intel. Um, if you want to use Sickle at at NERSC, we also can obtain some support for that through our contracts with Codeplay. Um, and this is, you know, again, 
it's a different, it's like a slightly different flavor, but it's also modern C++ or it's based on modern C++. And this could also be a good option for, for anyone who's really familiar with OpenCL. It'll, many of the concepts like a queue will, will feel really natural. In, in terms of, of support, in ter the, the SICL model is there's a number of different compilation options available that, that target a variety of different uh, architectures. Um, you have the DPC++ that's based on open source LLVM, like I mentioned. There are proprietary compilers from CodePlay. Um, you can, Xilinx has support for compiling to FPGAs. Um, and then there's AMD support through a project called Hipsicle. Um, and I, I don't know too much about NeoSicle, but there's uh, uh, there's also um, support for these like vector engines through that. So th this particular corner of the slide is is where uh, NERSC and ALCF are working together. Um, so right now, this is at a, a public fork of LLVM, but the, the eventual um, aim is the inclusion in the main project. Um, and we're, we're working on targeting a, a backend that, that generates PTX code directly. So you can still get very high performance. Um, And since it's, this is open source, so anybody with the recent NVIDIA GPU will, will also get the benefits of this, um, although we are targeting A100. And we're, we're also developing a lot of extensions to, to enable access to some of the key A100 features, like the tensor cores um, and some of the asynchronous um, operations that are maybe familiar to those um, who, who've done a lot of CUDA programming recently. Okay, so with, without going too much further, uh, what does this code look like? Um, and, and if you squint a little bit, it's, it's very similar to the Cocos code shown earlier. Um, the, the body of work is, again, expressed as this lambda function. Um, you have a, a parallel pattern. Um, with a, an execution range that's specified by like this range object, um, you you enqueue this work um, by submitting to a queue instead of using like the triple chevron function call. Um, and the other thing you'll notice is that all the data access is coming through these um, these buffer objects with a bunch of get ask access uh, handlers. And what, what this allows is for the, the SQL runtime to kind of automatically handle the data movement for you. Um, so it's, it can be a lot of effort to type all this out, but in the end, you can end up with, with quite efficient code because the runtime will know, okay, you're just reading this data and then you're writing, writing that data so I can stage this um, or keep it resident or whatever. Um, so this is a great idea. It can it can end up with a lot of tedium if you have really complex data structures. Um, so for the the more complex data structure in the latest version of SQL, there's now something called unified shared memory, and this is um, is is kind of analogous to the managed memory in CUDA. Um, so here you just declare sort of shared pointers that can be used anywhere. Um, and all that buffer and accessor stuff is gone, um, which makes it much more, um, sh shortens the code significantly, um, but it could, it could result in slightly less performance. Um, so if you, if you tried SQL before and thought that it was too verbose, the, the latest version definitely uh, improves that situation. So as for SQL at NERSC, um, it, it can compile and run today. Um, we don't have a, a full module file available at this exact moment, um, but I'm happy to make one available to you. Um, and we definitely want to hear 
if you're interested in sickle, I definitely want to hear from you. Um, you know, file a ticket with us, check the sickle channel in the nurse user Slack. Okay, so switching switching gears away from the C frameworks, um, I want to touch briefly on the parallelism built into languages itself. So in Fortran, um, if you write a do concurrent loop like this, or you use array intrinsics like matrix multiply, um, reshape, transpose, uh, et cetera, and I think they're adding more um, all the time, then you can just compile with, with this did par option with NVIDIA Fortran. And that will give you parallel code offloaded to, to a GPU. Um, and with, with no changes at all to your code, that's just 100% ISO Fortran. Um, and then I think NVIDIA might be the only compiler that does GPU offload, but there are uh, a number of other compilers like Intel, which will generate parallel CPU code in some cases with, with these do concurrent structures. So if that's if that's of interest to you, I definitely suggest checking out the NVIDIA blog post that I've linked here that, that kind of dives into the details of all what, what is and isn't supported. And then switching back to C++, um, I think that this is a little bit more full featured than the support in Fortran at the moment. Um, you have all of these, you have a bunch of uh, really powerful parallel algorithms. So like transform, transform, reduce, uh, you know, scans um, for each, et cetera. And if you check out the, the numeric algorithm and, and execution headers on your favorite, you know, C++ reference site, um, the most of what's in there is, is what you can do and which is which can be very powerful. Um, so again, I think checking out the uh, so and this is really like NVC plus plus can generate code um, for GPUs by using just the standard code by just turning on the appropriate flags. So so here's an example of that with uh, again that that same simple let's add two two vectors together. Um, so here I, I make some vectors, fill them up with some data on the host. And then on the device, I say, I want to do the transform algorithm with a parallel unsequenced execution policy um, on, on this, these iterators or those vectors. Um, and then adding them together is the, the operation I want to do in this uh, express in this lambda here. Uh, and then that's it. And then this this will get uh, turned into parallel code by NVC++ and, and execute on the GPU. Um, you can you can compile the same code with Intel and get parallel um, CPU code and and so on. So just just a few comments. If if though that sounds like an attractive approach for you, um, there's. Uh, I won't be doing a, a deep dive on any of these, um, but just a few of the, the things to keep an eye on. So atomic reference it is a great and powerful thing that allows some access to data to be atomic without requiring all accesses to be atomic. So often you'll have some array that you don't want to access atomically in all situations and because that has a huge performance impact. Um, there's a new standard uh, split phase barrier, which is, which is really useful for coordinating asynchronous work. Um, the ranges uh, have a lot of potential for better like, composition of, of different algorithms um, and can avoid some of the headaches of dealing with iterators. Um, you know, speaking of iterators, there's often a need to iterate over multiple collections together or need to do something based on um, some index. And so for that, you need either a zip or a counting iterator. Um, if you can get those, instead of writing them yourself, you can get them out of a uh, you know, library like Thrust or Boost usually. Um, 
And then another thing to watch is, uh, is MD span, which is the multi-dimensional span object, um, which is supposed to make working with multi-dimensional data, which happens quite often in science, better. Um, I also want to say this isn't an exhaustive list. There's tons of there's tons of new proposals and features, but these are just the ones that, that happen to be on my radar. Um, so it it's a great approach, but there's definitely some caveats and, and limitations. Um, you know, you're you're still waiting on really brand new modern features to be implemented. You have to use a very modern version of C++, which could be an issue for some legacy codes. Um, and then there's other cases if you have hierarchical parallelism um, or getting that last bit of performance, that can definitely be difficult with these standard language approaches. Okay, and um, at this point, I'd like to turn over the, the presentation to Chris, who's going to talk to us about um, OpenMP and directive based models. Cool. Thank you, Brandon. Let me just share my screen. Does this look okay to you? Yes, Chris. That's good. Great. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Chris Daly. Um, I work for the Advanced Technology Group at NERSC. Uh, sorry and to interrupt. There is like a um, window thing at the top. Sorry, can you say that again? A window thing at the top. Like the window decoration for Mac, like the close button, uh, things like that. It's just a minor uh, thing. Don't worry. It's uh, probably your uh, individual thing. It looks good to us. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm not sure how to fix that. Um, I hope you can tolerate it. Um, I'll just continue. Um, right, so yeah, I work for the Advanced Technology Group at NERSC, and this is about OpenMP for GPUs. So just as like a quick recap, I mean, I guess most people on the call are pretty familiar with OpenMP for CPUs. Um, so just as recap, it's a set of directives and APIs used to parallelize C, C++, and Fortran apps. And we find that many nurse codes are using OpenMP on the CPU. Um, oftentimes, just a few directives are used in user codes. Uh, for example, the parallel directive and the for directive, um, as shown in kind of this code fragment here, where we're just simply incrementing an array um, on the CPU where we're work sharing across all of the CPU threads. So this presentation will kind of extend from this and show you how to use OpenMP on the GPU. So the first thing is to look at the OpenMP thread hierarchy for GPUs. Um, so OpenMP um, it introduces some new directives in order to be able to use OpenMP on the GPU. So the first one that I want you to become familiar with is the target directive. So this is the directive that enables you to create a GPU kernel. So this is what is enabling you to um, execute code on a device. And then uh, an important consideration for GPUs is we need to make use of the massive parallelism available. So we have to create two levels of parallelism. So what OpenMP has introduced is um, a form of coarse-grained parallelism that's suitable for GPUs. So this is referred to as Teams parallelism. And then later on, you would use the familiar parallel directive in order to create the fine-grained parallelism. So using both together um, enables you to exploit the massive parallelism on the GPU. And it's useful to be able to compare the OpenMP thread hierarchy to the CUDA thread hierarchy that Brandon showed earlier. So he had this diagram where there's a CUDA grid of thread blocks. We see the multiple thread blocks. And then within each thread block, there are GPU threads. So then if we compare this with OpenMP, um, how they correspond to each other is one CUDA thread block is equivalent to one OpenMP team. And then OpenMP introduces a new directive called distribute. Um, this enables you to work share a loop um, across all of the um, OpenMP teams. And then secondly, a 
CUDA thread corresponds to an OpenMP thread, um, where, um, as before, we now have the four directive. This is enabling you to work share a loop over all of the threads. Um, an important thing that you need to do with um, GPU programming is obviously moving data um, between CPU and GPU. Uh, these have distinct memory spaces. On the CPU, you have your DRAM, and on the GPU, you have your high bandwidth memory. So OpenMP um, manages uh, the data in the GPU memory. It refers to it as the device data environment, using a combination of both, both implicit and explicit data management. Um, so in this code fragment here, we show how to map some data from the CPU to the GPU using the map clause. So breaking this um, code fragment down, we have the target directive. This is what is creating the GPU kernel. And then we have um, next to the target directive a map clause. Um, so what this is doing is creating a variable on the GPU. And because we're specifying a map type of two from, what this is doing is copying data to the GPU before the kernel executes. And then once the kernel has finished, we'll actually copy data back from the GPU to the CPU. Um, if we add some print statements, what we can see is um, we have different memory addresses on both the CPU and the GPU. Um, but kind of an important thing to kind of be aware is that we have this single variable name X, uh, but this is actually pointing to two separate variables. Um, on the host, we have the original variable, and on the device, uh, we have a corresponding variable. Um, so the OpenMP runtime is keeping track of this association, um, enabling you, the user, to be able to move data um, between both the original and the corresponding variable. Um, if we now just consider how to execute a simple example on the GPU, so this is now combining um, both the compute and the data management. Uh, the first three lines of this code fragment is just some boilerplate code in which we're um, allocating and initializing an array on the CPU. Um, we then move into the directives. So what we have is a combined target teams distribute parallel four directive. Um, so this is work sharing um, the work in the subsequent loop over all of the teams and all of the threads. And then as before, we have um, this map clause in order to um, handle our data management. So this is moving the data to the GPU and back from the GPU. So what we're seeing is we're seeing the updated value of X after this GPU kernel has completed. Um, it's useful this table here is really kind of getting to what are the variables that we have in our device data environment. So we actually have three variables. Uh, we have this variable x, which is our mapped variable. Um, this um, corresponds to um, Brandon's explanation in CUDA of data stored in global memory. So this is accessible by all of the threads and all of the teams. We then have a variable n, which is a first privatized scalar variable. So this is a per thread variable, um, which is initialized to the, the host value of 16,384. And finally, we have uh, the variable i. This is just a private scalar variable. Once again, this is per thread uh, that is uninitialized. Um, so one thing that Jack mentioned at the start of today is how important it is to minimize data movement between CPU and GPU in order to obtain high performance. Um, so what we can do with OpenMP programming model is we have um, a family of target data directives um, that can be used to keep the data on the GPU for multiple GPU kernels. So we can see the directive that we're using in this code fragment is a target enter data map. So what this is doing is creating this variable, creating and initializing this variable X on the GPU. So this will now remain present um, on the GPU until we have a corresponding exit data map um, when we would actually free the memory on the GPU. So where this is now really useful is we can now have multiple GPU kernels that can access um, this variable X on the device without any additional data movement. There's now no need for you to, to specify any map clauses um, because what the OpenMP runtime will see 
is the usage of the original variable x, it will see that it has already been mapped. And then when you're um, executing your GPU kernel, it will ensure that all references to x are to the corresponding device variable x. So it's a really powerful way um, that OpenMP provides in order to minimize data movement. Um, but it does come at a cost. And that is that the map clause does not always cause data movement in the way that um, a user may expect. Um, what, um, how the OpenMP programming model was designed is um, to make sure that there's no unnecessary data movement um, so what it does is it reference counts the map data in order to avoid any expensive data movement. So we can see where this can cause problems in user codes. So we have here in this code fragment that we, we've initialized some um, array X, which we're then mapping to the GPU. We then may decide in the user code to update this variable on the CPU. And naively, you'd expect just specifying a map clause in your um, target region would then propagate that value um, onto the GPU. Um, but that's not actually the case because all that has done is incremented the reference count. So the next two slides will just show two ways um, for us to fix this code. So the first method for um, ensuring consistent data environments is to use the target update directive. So what this will do is transfer data between the original and corresponding variable um, of this mapped variable. So we can see here now in the user code, before we um, execute the target region, we have this target update two in order to update the value of the GPU of the GPU's um, variable X. So then in the target region, we would have the expected value um, on the device. Similarly, um, uh, another method you can use is to use the always modifier um, for the map clause. So what this will do is it will force a data transfer irrespective of the reference count. So now the only way we've modified this map clause is to um, add this always, um, always word. And once again, in the GPU kernel, we would see the updated value. So this is just kind of two things to, to be aware of. Um, so this was kind of a really brief intro that just shows um, some of the compute and data management considerations uh, for OpenMP. Um, for using OpenMP on Perlmutter, we recommend the NVIDIA compiler. This is for all C, C++ and Fortran applications. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, we will soon have the Clang compiler, um, but this would only support C and C++ apps. Um, for reference in terms of what compiler options you would need to use, uh, there was a presentation on day one, building and running GPU applications on Palomata. And also we have this web page at NERSC, which not only goes through the compiler options, uh, it also includes some best practices for how you can get um, high performance with OpenMP. Um, on the topic of performance, uh, one thing I want to make you aware of is a new feature in OpenMP 5 called the loop directive. So this is particularly useful with the NVIDIA compiler, which as I just mentioned was, is the preferred compiler on Palomata. So this has a similar behavior to the distribute and for directives that we showed earlier, but it has one um, additional characteristic. So not only is it work sharing, it's also making an assertion that the loop iterations are independent. So this really enables the compiler to apply additional optimizations and deliver improved performance to you. So we've seen in particular with the NVIDIA compiler, there can be an advantage when you have multiple parallel loops. Um, it's beneficial to convert from the standard OpenMP 4.5 way to use in OpenMP loop. So just looking at this code fragment here, we see that the distribute directive has been replaced with the loop directive and the for directive once again has been replaced with the, the loop directive. So this is just kind of a, a quick performance consideration for the NVIDIA compiler. Um, I just want to move on quickly now to um, this OpenMP case study um, that we did. So this looks at a QCD mini app called SU3. And the highlight of our case study is we managed to achieve 97% of CUDA performance 
on an A100 GPU using OpenMP and the NVIDIA compiler. Um, we actually presented this work at uh, the GTC conference last year. So this was a joint presentation um, from me and Gurai um, Ozen, who is a uh, compiler engineer at NVIDIA. Um, our key uh, performance plot um, was this throughput plot. So this is the performance metric uh, for this SU3 benchmark. So we show several bars. The first is just showing the performance we obtained on the CPU, which was 139 gigaflops per second. We then looked at the CUDA version of this SU3 micro benchmark. And you can see it was significantly faster, more than a factor of 10. We got a throughput of 1,935 gigaflops per second. And then converting this CUDA code to OpenMP, we um, went through successive um, code optimizations as well as simplifications. Um, and we managed to achieve this 97% of CUDA performance, which is a really nice achievement. And I decided to choose this particular case study because this was one case study where the loop directive um, enabled us to obtain the highest performance with the NVIDIA compiler. Um, this is just my summary of what I consider some advantages of OpenMP over CUDA. Uh, kind of the big one that's been touched on before is that it's portable to the CPU um, as well as other vendors' GPUs. Uh, one thing that it does really well is the data management. So this uh, becomes important when your code has some very complicated data structures. If you have nested data structures with like lots of pointers and double pointers, um, you can move this data to the GPU with just a few directives. If you tried to do this with CUDA and a runtime API, you would need um, dozens and dozens of lines of code. So it's very, very burdensome trying to do this with APIs. Um, there are other kind of productivity wins. We've seen that we OpenMP provides directives in order to be able to work share um, loops between both teams and threads. If you're using CUDA, you kind of have to manually do this based on the thread ID and the block ID, which is just an additional burden that, um, yeah, it's just a pain to have to deal with. Um, another benefit of productivity win is that you can very easily fuse loops using the collapse clause. So this is really nice to be able to expose the parallelism required to make use of the, the massive parallelism on the GPU. If you're using CUDA, you'd have to manually fuse the loops and then have some like crazy integer arithmetic to figure out um, the, um, into just the, the multi-dimensional index space. Um, another benefit of OpenMP is you have um, a reduction abstraction. So this makes it really easy to perform the data reductions. Um, if you're doing this in CUDA, you'd have to either write it yourself and probably obtain low performance or use a, a library in order to obtain a high performance data reduction. Um, so, so in summary, there's, um, there's multiple productivity wins by using something like OpenMP over CUDA. Um, I want to just uh, make a quick note about OpenACC. So this is obviously an alternative directive-based approach. Um, the concepts are very, very similar, um, similar directives. Occasionally they have different names. Um, kind of one of the big differences is it's that it's a much more restrictive programming approach than OpenMP. Uh, for example, you have no thread ID and you have no thread synchronizations. Um, this does come with a benefit um, because it, it makes it easier to obtain high performance in OpenMP. Uh, so this is for kind of two reasons. I mean, the first is that because it's a much more restrictive programming approach, you, the programmer, you're forced to write um, much more GPU-friendly code. And the second is that because it's a, a more restrictive programming approach, it's easier for the compiler to support the capabilities. Um, so historically, we've seen that, um, especially using the NVIDIA compiler, that OpenACC applications can perform very, very well. Um, however, um, as um, Jack mentioned in the, the first talk of today, uh, we've had an NRE contract with um, NVIDIA in which we've been uh, kind of co-developing the OpenMP offload, uh, OpenMP offload capability in their compiler. And We've actually demonstrated in a, in a paper at Supercomputing last year that a suite of NERSC OpenMP applications can achieve more than 
of OpenACC performance. Um, so there's really no reason to be concerned that um, OpenMP applications will perform poorly. Um, but at the same time, if you have an open, open ACC application, there's no need for you to go out and um, quickly convert it to OpenMP. Uh, the NVIDIA compiler will capably support um, both OpenACC and OpenMP applications. And I guess, um, yeah, the questions. If there's any questions, we can answer them on Google Doc. Um, Brandon, do you have a few words to say on this slide? Um, yeah, just that there's there's obviously many, many options for, for getting your code up and, and running to take advantage of the GPUs on Perlmutter. Um, and I think we, we covered kind of the, the main ones that we are looking at on the NERSC side. Um, but we are, of course, here to support you. Um, and we're, we're happy to engage and, and talk through kind of any of the options that were presented today. And we can also um, <clears throat> help you out if, you, if there's something you didn't see. Um, if you want to discuss its, its availability at NERSC or um, what, what, your, what our recommendation is, we we're happy to do that. Um, and I just wanted to end as well with um, a few call outs. Um, for those of you on the NERSC user Slack, there's um, a number of relevant Slack channels um, for the, the community of, of users out there who um, may be also writing code in the same model. So you could kind of get in touch with people that way. Um, if you want to hear from us, in addition to the Google Doc that's available right now, you can always. Um, write to us in a ticket where we're happy to to um, have those and, and have those discussions and then obviously this was a very high level overview um, so keep keep an eye out for upcoming events that are are targeting specific models and, and tool chains